Round ears. Despite being the second gene in the top row of the niche mutation menu, we don't see it in-game all that often. This is because, under normal conditions, you can only unlock it in story mode by inviting a nicheling who displays round ears into your tribe. Granted, in Sandbox, you can also set your mutations to Unlock All Genes mode, or you can manually give a Sandbox starter nicheling copies of the round ears gene so that it displays automatically and unlocks. But something about this gene is... odd. It really feels like you have to force it to appear. Until you don't. I'll explain what I mean in a bit. What's up, Buttercups? My name is Scaletree, and I'm excited to bring you my first experimental niche video on my channel. Buckle up, because we have three sets of experiments today about the round ears gene, and the conclusions I found are fascinating, to say the least. First off, I decided to run a mini-experiment to see if round ears would appear in a sandbox starter if I removed it from the list of banned genes. Thankfully, instead of having to cram nine starters on some ports and make a bunch of burner save files, I can just click the Show Possible Animal button as many times as I'd like. To get a decent sample size without sitting here forever, I clicked the Show Possible Animal button 100 times. You can see some footage of me doing so now. Once I was done, I reviewed each nicheling I generated and came up with this set of statistics. Of the 100 possible sandbox starters, 68 had medium ears in both slots, and 32 had medium ears dominant and big ears recessive. Oddly, this means none of the starters had two copies of big ears, which is an interesting side note and may suggest that the pseudo-random nature of sandbox starters prevents big ears from showing up organically. More to the point, though, not one starter had even a single copy of the round ears gene at all. For comparison's sake with another gene that requires inviting into the tribe to unlock, recessive antennae appeared in ten nichelings, and one nicheling even had it expressed. That would mean antennae could appear as unlocked by default if they were on that starter in an actual save file. I understand this is a relatively small sample size, but this suggests that it's highly improbable for round ears to show up, if at all, for a sandbox starter. When we note that the horn slot also has more potential genes for starters to pull from, the fact that antennae showed up much more often makes the possibility of round ears seem even less promising. But let's say we didn't want to chance it. Let's say we decided we wanted those round ears unlocked, so we could enjoy a little more variety in our everyday nichelings. To do this, as mentioned earlier, we either start a game with all genes unlocked, or put in one or more starters with at least one copy of the gene. How often should we expect round ears to appear? Well, according to the wiki, the dominance order sets round ears at third place in the hierarchy of ear types. This means we should anticipate round ears to be recessive to medium or big ears, but dominant over Beryena ears. This all sounds fairly standard, but my experience in-game has suggested that there may be some kind of glitch in the system that causes them to display more often than they should. Hence why I feel you have to force round ears to appear, until you don't. Here's some footage of sandbox starter parameters I set up for part two of my experiment to see how Round Ear's dominance is actually treated in-game. Each nicheling is given a name corresponding with where I placed each ear gene into a guaranteed slot. The ones with red gems have round ears put into the top slot. The ones with blue gems have round ears put into the bottom slot. And the ones with yellow gems are control cases, where a less dominant typical ear gene is on the slot above a more dominant typical ear gene. For a better viewing experience, I also ensured that Batnose and Derp Snout were forbidden, so that we can clearly see the dominant ear types when I start up a save file. With that set up, I dive into a new world with these nichelings to see what awaits me, and the moment it loads in, it appears my suspicions were correct. I review each of the yellow gem control cases one at a time, and sure enough, despite placing the less dominant typical ear gene in the top slot for each nicheling, the more dominant one is expressed in exactly the way one would expect, especially after playing this game for hundreds of hours. Like me. <coughs> anyway, I then reviewed the red gem nichelings, each of which had round ears placed into the top slot. 
While it does appear above Bergina ears as expected, it also appears above medium ears and big ears, which is not what its dominance order on the wiki would suggest at all. As a matter of fact, the blue gem nichelings, each of which had round ears placed into the bottom slot, were the only ones that had it expressed in accordance with exactly how the wiki said they should. As dominant over Bergina ears, but recessive to medium and big ears. So... what does this mean? In a way, I think this instantly tells me something about Bergina ears, in that it seems evident that the code confirms that they will always be recessive if another ear type is inherited for the other slot. But we're not here to talk about Bergina ears, regardless of their cuteness. Round ears are the topic, and I'm determined to understand at least partly why their dominance order doesn't appear to be properly expressed. This leads me into the third experiment of the day, a Breedapalooza. I've set up new starter parameters so that I have four mating pairs. Team Black, headed by Knight and Shade, has the male with two copies of round ears, and the female with two copies of medium ears. Team White, headed by Ice and Snow, has the male with two copies of medium ears, and the female with two copies of round ears. Team Red, headed by Flame and Ember, has the male with two copies of round ears, and the female with two copies of big ears. Team Yellow, headed by Noon and Day, has the male with two copies of big ears, and the female with two copies of round ears. As you likely surmised, I separated them by fur color to avoid accidental breeding between the families. For the sake of not having to restart multiple times due to inaccurate colors, I forbade toxic body and ensured each starter would express no pattern, despite how much I like those genes. Again, since this experiment is about ears, I made sure to forbid bat nose and derp snout. Lastly, just to make sure I don't have any super slow toads amongst my starters, I ensured each nicheling would express normal hind legs. I also lengthened their adult lifespans so that I wouldn't have to worry about them dying on me, and ensured there would be plenty of food and nesting material for the inevitable wave of cubs. The reason I have four pairs instead of two for each gene I have competing with round ears is because I'm interested to see if there's a specific order in which genes are inherited. Since the location of round ears in the DNA strand seems critical for its expression, I'm wondering if nichelings may pull genes from the father first and the mother second, or vice versa, and if this experiment can, by extension, prove that. So as to not overload my game too drastically, I figured a sample of about 10 cubs per pair would be enough. Again, that sample size isn't the biggest, and thus may not enable a fully accurate conclusion, but I'm just a fan of science. I'm not a scientist. Anyway, I bred them all like crazy and watched the magic happen. At one point, a big-bodied wanderer with a single wing caught my attention, and I invited her into the tribe. She wasn't there to breed, though. Just to vibe. Why can't cool wanderers like that show up when I'm in a legitimate save file and not when I'm doing a goofy experiment no one asked for? <laughs> it's beyond me. Either way, once I was done, I reviewed each batch of nichelings. Team Black and Yellow ended up kind of smushed together between this one part of the riverbank and shore, but it's evident that all cubs born to Team Black have medium ears, and all cubs born to Team Yellow have round ears. Team White, excluding the honorary winged wanderer, had all cubs born with round ears. Lastly, Team Red had all cubs born with big ears. From this round of testing, I've reached two tentative conclusions. The first one is that round ears seem very much bugged, at least in sandbox mode where all of these experiments took place. If the round ears functioned as expected, then none of the babies born should have had them. Instead, it appears as if they functioned as they did in Experiment 2, where the placement of the round ear gene in the DNA strand seems to be its deciding factor for expression. This makes it unlike any other gene in the game in terms of inheritance, as far as I'm currently aware. The second one is that my hypothesis that all nichelings will inherit a gene from one specific parent before the other now has supporting evidence. Every cub born in this breed of Palooza inherited the mother's ear type, 
leaving the dad's ears in the proverbial dust. This is much harder to notice in typical gameplay, because round ears hardly happen and the dominant recessive order of genes will shuffle automatically. But in this isolated environment, we have compelling evidence that the game will pull from the mother's genetic code first when randomizing a cub. With that, we've reached the end of my first YouTube video. If you stuck around this long, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed my content. I have another niche experiment idea for the future, this time about the island where Adam meets Eve in story mode, and how it may impact the ability to pass on mutations in the earliest part of the campaign. If you like this video and are interested to see more, I'm sure you know what to do. In the meantime, I've been your host of Scale Tree, and I hope to see you around. Bye guys!